So hello, everybody. And it's it's just lovely to see all the faces and a lot of names that I recognize. And um, and if you're new to this, you're very, very welcome. Um, it's going to be a quick, quick session, a quick run through mostly of the science today, but we'll build on that um, and subsequent um, and lessons and, and make it more more regularly as we go along. But the idea is then um, that I just want to set the stage for understanding a uh, sort of climate jargon um, within a narrative context. So I graduated uh, with a degree in environmental biology uh, back in the last millennium. And um, back then we knew about climate change and uh, the fossil, the big, yeah, big, big oil, the fossil fuel companies, they also knew about it and they knew what impact it was going to have on the climate even back then. So that was, you're talking, that was in 1990 and before that. So, uh, going on 50 years. So I was a biology teacher for 15 years and then I got into writing and I've been writing ever since uh, 2008. Um, and then I took part in writing the earth with the Irish Writers Centre and that's where they paired us with the scientists. So I was kind of cheating a wee bit because I already had a bit of science in, in my background. And um, and the, the scientists, they were with ICRAG, their research um, centre uh, associated with the University of Dublin, uh, University College Dublin. So during that time, I wrote a climate change play called Toxic Relationships, and um, it was staged last year in various places around Ireland, and it's due to be staged again next year. And um, but it was during rehearsals, uh, listening to uh, the actors who were absolutely brilliant, but they they, they struggled a little bit with some of the terminology. Um, that I had used and it was then that I realised that the general public maybe doesn't understand a lot of the jargon that we're seeing even in daily sort of news reports even. So this is where I want to sort of bridge the gap between the science and the climate writers so that everybody can, that the sort of the, or the general public really, so that climate writers can um, be a narrative um, a, with, with a solid grounding in the science. And what we're looking at today are the facts. We're looking at scientific facts. Facts are not opinions and they're not a belief system. And there's there's just no negotiating that. It's it's their facts, okay? So um climate deniers, um, I I really just can't understand it because the science community has come out and made these facts very, very um you know, straightforwardly, and uh, there's no denying them. So anyway, um, I'm going to go over to do a PowerPoint presentation to click through this, and then we'll have a wee bit of um, a sort of question and answer session at the end. Okay, so. So what is climate fiction? It's creative writing about climate change, and it can be a powerful way to explore the complex issues involved, and it is complex on one hand, but on the other hand, it's extremely simple. And when you see the PowerPoint presentation, hopefully you'll understand why I'm saying that. So um, it provides a space to share emotions and stories that might not be shared in scientific papers, but it educates the public about climate change and it inspires action. So this is basically a case of not leaving anyone behind. I'm starting with a really basic concept of the earth being a ball, um, and it has a layer, a, a partial layer actually of water on it, which we call our ocean. And it, that's made up of a liquid. And then around all of that, you have a mixture of gases, a layer of a mixture of gases, and that's called the atmosphere. And the most predominant gas in the atmosphere is nitrogen. Nitrogen um, is mostly inert. It doesn't actually do anything. Um, and it it could be like any of the other noble gases. It would just it's it just it's just there. Okay, um, it, there's no chemical reactions with the nitrogen in the air. Um, for the most part. Then we've got twenty one percent oxygen, which is what we breathe, and oxygen is also what burns carbon for the most part, and other other elements as well. But mostly it's it's carbon. For example, in our bodies, um, oxygen burns sugars and gives us energy to move and do all the things that we do. And um, and it's it's the sugar itself is actually a carbon compound as well. 
And you'll see in this diagram that carbon dioxide is actually a really very small percentage of the, the atmosphere, not 0.4% carbon dioxide and rising. So it's only a very small portion of the atmosphere, but it's very, very, very potent, if you like, okay, and important. So this slide, I've taken this slide, um, I've got like um, the reference along the bottom here, you'll see, I don't know if you can see that, but it's it's just to show you that these slides are coming from sources that I trust and, um, and they're, you know, science-based and science-backed. So the idea of carbon in the atmosphere, so how do we get carbon out into the atmosphere, right? So the carbon that goes out into the atmosphere comes mostly from burning fossil fuels. And burning fossil fuels produces the energy that we need for a lot of our everyday things, like transport, heating, air conditioning, cooking, all of those things. The carbon compounds are burnt in oxygen and they give out carbon dioxide and water. Now this equation, don't be scared by the equation, but I'm showing you this because for some people, it's a really visual way to see where this carbon is coming from. So um, you've got this right here where my cursor is circling. It's, you can see that this is CH4. This is actually methane. This is the carbon. This is the chemical form for methane. Oxygen here will give us carbon dioxide and water. Um, don't worry about these numbers here. I'm just putting that in for scientific accuracy. Now, this compound here could be coal. If it was coal, it would have a slightly different configuration here, but it would still have this carbon. And it might have some nitrogen in it, and it might have some sulfur in it, which would give us on this side, sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides, okay, which are also greenhouse gases. Um, sugar, for example, would have some oxygen in here, and that would give us exactly the same carbon dioxide and water. So it's a very basic, simple, repeating pattern of, a, of an equation. A carbon compound and oxygen will give us carbon dioxide and water. So the carbon emissions, um, this is by the different fuel types, worldwide, starting in 1750. You can see it was minuscule until about 1850. Then the Industrial Revolution kicked in and you could see that a lot of coal was being burnt and that was given out. Now, the, the, up, this, up the vertical axis, you can see is in billions of tons of carbon dioxide. So if you think about carbon dioxide being a gas, it's going to take up a lot of volume to make a ton, right? So Five billion tons is a huge volume into our atmosphere of, of carbon dioxide. And when, you, when you're looking at the, the upper end of this scale, we're talking about 35 billion tons of uh, carbon dioxide in these, these years from you know, the, latter, the most recent years. Things, things to note as well is that there's a big hike up here in 1950, and that's oil which is because of uh, cars and gas. Um, another, another thing to note is this little blip up here. I hope everybody can actually see my cursor moving, but this little blip here at the end, just up from <clears throat> very close to where the end of the graph is. And you, this wee dip was the pandemic. All right, so I, I just thought that was really interesting. So it shows you that if we work collectively, we can actually reduce our carbon output. All right, so that is carbon out. Carbon in, what I mean by carbon in is, what I mean is taking it out of the atmosphere and trapping it either in a tree or a body or some other way of keeping it in, right? So taking it out of the atmosphere um, and uh, keeping it in, trapped in somewhere else, okay? So uh, photosynthesis uses light energy. Green leaves take in carbon dioxide and water. And if you remember from the first equation I showed you, carbon dioxide and water was what was produced during combustion, during the, the carbon compounds being um, burnt, if you like, in oxygen. So uh, the green leaves taking the carbon dioxide and water and they make carbon compounds and oxygen. So a carbon compound in this context, in a, in, in a leaf, 
would probably be a sugar mixed and then that would become a starch and then that would be also used by the tree to eventually make the wood of the tree, the tree trunk, the branches, the leaves and all the different bits. So, and it gives out oxygen, which is fortuitous for us because we breathe in oxygen. And there's an equation to show how that works. So the, the leaf will take in carbon dioxide and water. It will use light energy here and it will produce sugar. And that's the formula for sugar and oxygen. So we've looked at carbon, how it gets into the atmosphere, how it is taken out of the atmosphere. So it was it's taken out of the atmosphere by a photosynthesis. So billions of years ago, it might have been a very, very carbon rich atmosphere, carbon dioxide rich atmosphere. And it the with the advent of green plants, we then took a lot of that carbon dioxide out. It was stored in the bodies of the plants and animals and the fossil fuels then um, became a arose from the remains of those plants and animals as they died and decayed over millions of years. So they have a high carbon content. Examples are coal, crude oil, petrol and natural gas. And they're all examples of fossil fuels. And the fossil fuels are burned for energy like we talked about. And uh, the problems are they're dangerous for human health. There is a particulate air pollution. So you're talking about the smoke, you know, when you burn coal and you see the smoke coming out of the chimneys, um, that's bad for human health. Um, it, it they also cause the highest levels of greenhouse gas emissions. So any burning of fossil fuels causes a greenhouse gas emission. A greenhouse gas emission, we're going to explain those words in a, you know, as we go through this, but it, a fossil fuel releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, they're not renewable, so they will run out. And another big side effect of it is that there's an economic reliance on countries with large deposits of oil and that is probably fueling a lot of the wars that are happening on our planet today. Now, you can see this rise in fossil fuel use mirrors exactly the rise in carbon dioxide, even to the little blip there during the pandemic. So there's just no dispute in the fact that fossil fuels are contributing to the amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And just a little quick word here, renewable energy. I'm not going to dwell on it because we're going to do a wee bit more about it sort of halfway through. But renewable energy sources are like solar, wind, thermal, um, uh, hydropower, ocean. Uh, geothermal, sorry, is like um, they would use a lot in Iceland, but they've got like um, hot springs and whatnot. Uh, ocean energy uh, using the waves. And they're cleaner and they're safer for human health than fossil fuels. So it is also bioenergy or biomass, bioenergy. Um, such as wood, uh, charcoal, dung and other manures. Um, and, it, and basically, though, it's not a great system because um, it still creates a greenhouse gas when it's burnt. It's still so when you burn wood, charcoal, manure, you still get carbon dioxide released into the atmosphere. And also you've got sort of other side effects up, such as deforestation and uh, land use and habitat destruction issues. OK, now. Greenhouse gases, where I'm at for time, just double checking. Great. So a gas that absorbs heat energy um, is a greenhouse gas. So carbon dioxide absorbs heat energy that is emitted from the Earth's surface. So think back to that first graph I, or the diagram that I showed you of the Earth with this layer of atmosphere around it. Um, the sun's light comes through the atmosphere, but then the uh, when it tries to leave the atmosphere, it if you like, bounces off the carbon dioxide and it, it, it gets trapped in the atmosphere. So carbon dioxide, methane and water vapour are the most important greenhouse gases. Methane behaves the same way. Um, in fact, it's something like 82 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Um, and to a lesser extent, you have surface level ozone, which is just a, a form of oxygen. You've got nitrous oxide, so that's... that's um, Oxygen is made from burning uh, things with high concentrations of nitrogen in it. And then your CFC gases um, also. So the hydrofluorocarbon gases or your CFCs used to be like the propellant in hairsprays back in the 90s. We noticed this hole in the ozone layer. That was our CFCs. We've been able to pull back on our CFC uses and uh, it has made a, a huge um, 
a positive impact on our, uh, on our atmosphere. So the greenhouse effect is the warming of the Earth's surface due to trapping the heat by greenhouse gases. So we've looked at what, all, what greenhouse gases are. It's mostly carbon dioxide and methane. Um, and the significance is that the greenhouse effect causes global warming. It actually causes the planet to warm up and that disrupts natural systems. Now, a lot of people are going to start going, well, if the planet's warming up, why are we getting bad weather? Why do we get extreme snow? And we're going to come to that. But for the moment, we're just talking about the, the idea that the greenhouse effect causes global warming. And when you're writing about this, you can use vivid Im imagery, such as comparing the greenhouse effect to a thermal blanket around the earth. And if you think back to that very, very first really simple diagram, that's the kind of thing that, 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 that we are dealing with. So global warming versus climate change. So I touched on this, this idea that global warming is, uh, um, the global warming is um, the increase of the average temperature of the planet. So some places of the planet will be getting warmer faster than others. This is an average over the entire planet. It's a big place, so it the average is the fluctuation does get ironed out. Okay. The climate change refers to the changes in weather patterns and growing seasons around the planet as a result of, in this case, global warming. But you can also have climate change from global cooling as well. Um, so climate change will refer to both of those things. Um in the context that we have climate change as well, and we do get these things like the big um, snowstorm in Buffalo last year or the year before, um, the, the reason for that, that, that was the polar vortex that they kept talking about. And that was basically um, the, the weather patterns changed so much that the, this ice belt if you like came down or this icy weather came down from the north pole into parts of the north north america that didn't that wasn't that weren't used to getting them to this extreme so climate change as a result of global warming can actually make some places cooler and that can get very that that feeds into the the doctrine of of a climate denier when they say oh well how can you call this global warming if it's getting colder and that that should exp that's explaining why that happens it's a complex thing, but the world is now starting to agree that the temperatures are rising. There's still debate as to why they're rising. Um, the climate deniers will probably still say that it's nothing to do with human activity, but the previous graphs also fall in line here to show you that as the use of fossil fuel increased, carbon dioxide output increased, and the temperatures have all increased. It's not a coincidence. Um, those are all facts. They are all linked as well. And you can even see the dip here from the pandemic years. Okay, now, tipping point. This is important. The tipping point is the point at which the series of small changes or incidences becomes significant and critical, okay? And it represents irreversible damage, so like melting the glaciers or coral reef collapse, which we're already starting to see. And that, you know, when you're writing about this, you can use suspenseful language to describe the tipping point as a one way door or a point of no return. And it emphasizes the need for immediate action. So this is a magazine, uh, like an online magazine called Grist. Um, this is the type of um, thing that it talks about. It, 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 but this slide, I think, really should scare all of us. It's um, official that 2024 is already the hottest year on record. And it is also the first year to surpass the 1.5 degree Celsius benchmark that, that was that was said to be the tipping point by the part the 27 the 2015 Paris Agreement. Um, let me just check my time. Right, good. All right. Carbon footprint is is Another term that's used a lot in, um, you'll hear it, um, and it's the amount of greenhouse gases, particularly carbon dioxide, that a person, organization, event, or product produces. And it's usually measured in tons. 
Again, think about that. Measuring a gas in tons, that's a lot of gas. It helps quantify individuals and collective impacts on climate change. And you can personalize this concept by comparing it to everyday activities. You know, what is it? What is your carbon footprint in driving somewhere as opposed to, say, walking there and um, eating a hamburger as opposed to having, I don't know, a carrot or whatever? Okay, so I'm getting facetious, but that's kind of the, the idea. So carbon sequestration, that's a very hard word to say sometimes. Um, carbon sequestration is the process of capturing and storing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And uh, one way of doing it is photosynthesis. And we showed you how that worked um, earlier in the presentation. Um, the problem is if we can figure out a way to sequester carbon, people might not try to reduce their carbon output, thinking that this is an easy answer to the problem. Um, and and it, it isn't because it probably will take up a lot of resources to actually do this and it will have a knock on effect um, further down the line. Um, let me see. I, oh, I'm stuck. It's not doing anymore. Yeah. Carbon neutrality is when the carbon uh, output um, equals the carbon input. So a balance between emitting carbon and absorbing carbon. And a key goal in climate change, uh, global climate agreements, is to curb climate change. So you can emphasize the journey toward this goal with terms like carbon budgeting or balancing the carbon scale to make it feel achievable and relevant to readers. Now, um, definition, the ability of um, communities, ecosystems or systems to anticipate. So climate, re climate resilience. So I'm just going to finish on these very quickly because we're going to come back to that. But the resilience is being able to adapt um, to um, uh, pr or prepare for these disruptions. And um, it highlights, highlights proactive steps in adapting to climate change rather than only focusing on negative impacts. And we're going to do this through looking at relatable stories of human or environmental adapt uh, adaptability. Migration versus uh, mitigation, sorry, mitigation versus adaption. Again, mitigation is refers to efforts to reduce or prevent the emissions and uh, adaptation is, um, I'm sorry, I'm just going to go skip down to this. Oh, yeah, I'm going to just go briefly through that. These are resources um, that, again, we, I can come back to and I will be using. I want to just quickly nip to the end. Um, and then you can also do search climate change in libraries and I to get books on the subject and read up about it. And also the Irish Writers Centre has a great climate writing session. Um, if you just Google Irish Writers Centre um, climate writing, you will get to this page and you'll find out a wee bit more about it. their next ones on the 20th of November. OK, so what, I, what I'm going to do now is what's called, and we've, I'm going to try and employ these a lot, um, it's called a chat waterfall. So if everybody could just sort of have a think about one term um, or phrase that we discussed, that I discussed, or that I that I kind of went through in the PowerPoint presentation, um, and um, that is maybe new to you, or that you're you've a better understanding of now. It would be great if you could drop that into the chat now, and um, but don't press return, and then it will all hit return at the same time, and uh, it should all just come down in a in the thing. Um, so that's one phrase or one piece of terminology that we use in climate that. Um, talk, you know, talking about climate that we don't normally, um, that we don't maybe understand before. So go send them into our thing to we see. Um, oh, nice tipping point. I'm glad that tipping point has been explained and that you understand what tipping point is. And um, the need to trap carbon. Great. Yes, carbon sequestration. Um, the first time I saw that, I had to look that up, and that was recently enough. So yeah, yeah. That fiction, that fiction will be powerful way. The 1.5 degree benchmark. Yes, Marianne, yeah. Planting more trees, yeah. Global warming versus global change. Yes, climate change, good, good. So that's that's nice to see that um, everybody has, well, not that, but so many have taken something away. Um, and um, so just basically to recap, um, we need to blend accurate terminology with engaging narrative strategies 
to get our message across 